It's Behind the Headlines on WLIWFM. Uh, for those of you joining us for the first time, this is where we bring together uh, the award-winning community journalists throughout the East End, and we dive a little deeper into the week's news. I'm Joe Shaw. I'm the executive editor of the Express News Group. We publish the Southampton Press, the East Hampton Press, the Sag Harbor Express, and the websites 2070s.com and sagharborexpress.com. With me is my co-host, Bill Sutton, who's the managing editor of the Express News Group. Good morning, Bill. Good morning, Joe. Good morning, everybody. So with us today, we have Brianne Letta, who is a staff writer at the Times Review Media Group. Hey, Brianne, welcome back. Hi, thank you for having me here. Uh, Denise Civiletti, who is the editor of uh, Riverhead Local, one of our regulars. Good morning, Denise. Good morning, good to see you guys. And really happy for the first time uh, to bring on to the show, J.D. Allen. He's the Assistant News Director and Long Island Bureau Chief for WSHU Public Radio uh, in Connecticut and a good friend of all of ours. Hey, J.D., how you doing? Hey, so glad to be here with you guys. So you're, you're the star of the show today. We're, uh, we're going to focus on you because <laughs> you've, you've got some stuff to talk about. Um, you just dropped a new uh, podcast that's available called Higher Ground that focuses on climate change. And I think it specifically looks at how it's affecting uh, our region. And I want you to talk a little bit. T- tell us a little bit about what, what the podcast is, where we can find it, all the basic information. Sure. Yeah. So WSHU Public Radio, we launched this new Long Island climate podcast out of our Long Island Bureau, uh, which is on the campus of Stony Brook University. And um, we kind of had this idea in February as we were crossing our fingers saying, oh, the pandemic might be uh, coming to a close, hopefully soon. Um, What do we really need uh, to get into our communities to talk about that maybe we didn't uh, think too hard about over the last year. And um, well, the environment is not going to get any better unless we start talking about it and uh, getting into those communities. So what never happens in media, but never happens in public media, especially is that the project was actually funded right at the start, which was fantastic and allowed me to get a small team together as we planned out Higher Ground, which is our new podcast that we just launched this week. And what we do is that we go into communities across Long Island and we try to explore how we're coping with rising tides and climate change because climate change is already here. I mean, we, we see it every single day, um, whether we recognize that it's in our backyards or not. You know, I wanted to ask you, you said it was funded up front. That has the funding also has a bit of a low connection, right? Yeah, so the funding was fantastic. It came from the Alan Alda Center for Communicating Science. That's also at Stony Brook University. They're kind of like a, a neighboring office to ours. And as we were chatting about this in our uh, in our newsroom, um, some looky loos and open ears had some ideas about um, you know uh, uh, about how this is a great mechanism for communicating science. Uh, and so we were able to get a grant through them, and they. Uh, Cavley Foundation. And um, we really went into this um, with solutions journalism in mind, which is something that I know that um, journalists off air talk about a lot, um, which is kind of like a movement in journalism uh, to complicate narratives of, of, of things that we maybe talk about all the times, but we don't think about um, outside of the idea of conflict. And when we were talking about solutions journalism, um, uh, the Alan Alda Center was thrilled because it aligns with their idea of how do we uh, reach people where they are and being able to communicate science and in this way, climate science. It's really interesting because Alan Alda, of course, a longtime East End resident, and this is a passion of his, is about bringing science to the larger world and being able to communicate in a way that makes sort of takes the mystery out of it. And this is a topic uh, I, you know, you touched on it. I, I, I find it fascinating that in the last year or so uh, it's become harder and harder to be a climate change denier. That's for sure. I think there were a lot of folks out there who had some hesitancy about whether this was some type of a media invention, but I think the last year or two and certainly the trends over the last few years have made that pretty difficult. You talked about the fact that we're already seeing climate change impact in our region. Can you talk, uh, and I wanna open it up to the panel after, but but can you talk about some of the places that you identified uh, in the podcast that 
demonstrate that climate change impacts are starting to be felt already on the East End. Oh my gosh, we see it everywhere all the time. I mean, um, we've had so many storms this uh, this summer that has made us reevaluate, you know, living on the coast. And that doesn't mean that you own a house on the water, but that you're just here on Long Island, period. I mean, uh, you look at national flood maps and uh, there's progressions that show entire communities being washed away. And when we were going through the pitching of this, uh, of this podcast, um, the original title was um, washed away or uh, washed out. And mm. uh, it was way too negative um, as a perspective because it, it that really means that, uh, you know, Bill, uh, Joe, uh, Brianne, Denise, we all have to move. And um, <laughs> that is a topic that we do kind of explore in this because it's like, well, if we have to move, where, where do we move? And those are really important topics for us to discuss. Um, but we went with higher ground because that is kind of what we're doing right now. We raise our homes out of flood zones um, if we can afford it. And we bolster our sa- our beaches and our sand dunes to prevent massive flooding. Um, so we explore those topics out um, all along the North and um, South Fork. Um, we do a lot of work in Riverhead with um, our agriculture. We took a little bit of a tour at Palmanock Vineyard. Um, I swear we were actually working. It was not just a day drinking kind of day. Um, but I mean, it's it's palpable, the effects that we see in a place like that. Um, that has How are they a, seeing it there? What, what, what does it show up like in agriculture, for instance? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, Denise uh, and Bill, you're you're a Riverhead local. Um, well, not from Riverhead local, but you are. You live in Riverhead, and um, you know, Pomonoc Vineyard is not on the water. It's um, a mile away from uh, the Peconic Bay, and about um, a, a mile away from uh, the Long Island Sound. And it even experiences the saltwater intrusion of the. Um, of, of, of the waters around it kind of coming up underneath the vines. And that has a really dramatic effect in when they're able to um, harvest and how well the, their harvests come in. And if it gets any worse, you know, they're going to have to figure out a, a new way of doing their industry. And you, you times that by the 50 um, wineries across eastern Long Island. And we're going to have some serious issues when it comes to not only agriculture, but tourism and, um, you know, our downtown communities. You're, you're seeing that, I think, on the South Shore, too, Joe, with, with some of the farms in Sacaponic and Bridgehampton, where they where they're have acreages that they just can't utilize anymore because the, you know, the, the ground is is so saturated with with salt water that you know stuff just stops growing. And, and that's recent. And in a few years, we've had a couple of stories about that. We, we how, does it, how does climate change come into play with, with the saltwater infusion, J.D.? Sure. Well, uh, climate change. Uh, so we got uh, rising tides and the rising tides is what contributes to the water um, raising not only um, on our beaches, but in our uh in our, uh, in, our, in, our, in our water table. And the, as the water table itself rises and it has that salt water in it, um, that is how it gets into, you know, right beneath our, right beneath our feet, whether, you know, we see it or not, it's there. Um, it's one of the reasons why some really historic crops on Long Island are not ve- feasible anymore, like potato farms. Um, you know, saltwater intrusion was one of the things that very early on started to impact uh, potatoes. Um, but what really kind of killed potatoes for us was uh, the type of invasive pests that we were seeing um, in our potato farms, which were really early indicators of climate change. And we didn't really quite recognize it at the time. And we threw a whole lot of pesticides at it. Mm. And those pesticides are no longer legal. Um, and therefore, between salt water intrusion, salt spray, and these invasive pests that are here because our our warming waters and our climate is changing, um, even as far back as the 70s, that's why these really historic crops are not here anymore. Let me ask you this. I, I said that I think that, that the climate change oh, denial is starting to fade, but there are still echoes of it out there. And I think one of the things you'll hear from people is, yeah, there, there were a lot of storms this year and we may have more to come 
uh, before the season ends in November. But storms are cyclical. You have bad years, you have good years. Um, it's not necessarily evidence of the climate changing. What would you say in response to that from the research you've done? Uh, I mean, it's just boldface wrong. Um, and we, we did encounter that a lot in this podcast where there are people who recognized elements of climate change in their backyard, but they didn't recognize that it was actually climate change that was impacting them. They, there's this perception that climate change is going to be this moment in time that's going to flip like a switch mm. and our lives are going to change like it's an Armageddon moment. And um, while that's a really doomsday type scenario, that doomsday is actually kind of playing out over time. And we see the accelerated effects of it, you know, in our um, how many extreme weather events that we have in how much coastline we lose every year um, to, you know, to to erosion, um, which is intensified by rising tides and storms not only on our shores, but in shores miles and miles and miles and miles away. And, I mean, and warmer take... and warmer waters, too. I mean, the, the water Absolutely. temperature has risen and that allows the, the storms to have a greater intensity. Um, you know, we may not be seeing more storms uh, quantity wise, but the storms that we're seeing are, are, are stronger because they, you know, they can come further north with the warmer waters. Sure. And our perception of it is also kind of skewed towards the summer where we think of hurricane season. But there's a whole lot of damage that happens during the winter months when it comes to nor'easters and some of those winter storms where we're not on the beach. We're not paying attention to the storms coming. And um, that's where we're seeing a lot of our coastline actually getting chipped away when we're not on the beach and not paying attention. Brianna, Denise, I'm curious whether... Um, you're finding that the conversations that take place now in town halls and village halls, uh, whether climate change is part of that conversation. Brian, are, are you running into that more now uh, as, as we become more and more aware of these impacts? Oh, for sure. Um, whenever there's like, say, a proposed project, um, like at a village hall or town hall meeting, uh, one of the things I hear people saying most often is what, a what about climate change? How is this going to impact the environment? So for example, um, I was writing about a miniature railroad that the Greenport Rotary Club put up in Moore's Woods. And uh, one of the arguments was that, oh, this might negatively impact the forest area because it's in, in like a wetlands, like, like classified area. So that was one of the arguments. And even like there's a proposed hotel for main road. And one of the main arguments against it is like, you know, this is going to hurt the environment where we're going to lose all this like nature and development. And, you know, so it's very much on people's minds in a way it wasn't uh, just a couple of years ago. Right. I think, I think it's, it's been weaved into the conversation about just about every project uh, that the comes conversation up now. has absolutely changed in Riverhead and town hall and Riverhead. Um, uh, not that long ago, just a few years ago, there was, I would say, a majority of the board members thought it would like would say things like it was a hoax, like they would, you know, out flat out say stuff like that. Um, but we've uh, moved to a point where um, they talk about it, they acknowledge it. And um, one of the first things uh, the town, the new town supervisor did when she took office, her credit was um, called uh, Congressman Zeldin and got the. Uh, his assistance in bringing the Army Corps of Engineers to Riverhead to, to do a, um, a study to, to begin the process of uh, trying to advise the town what it could do to um, uh, take climate change into account, let's say. Um, I mean, it, you know, you talk to people like you did, J.D., uh, Kevin McAllister, and he's got very strong opinions about um, using man-made solutions to... Um, you know, fortify and you know, harden the coastline and fortify develop, you know, developed areas. Um, and, um, I, you know, when I hear the Army Corps, like that's traditionally what they what they do. Right. I mean, in a lot of ways and a lot of projects. But, um, you know, so they've, they've begun that process. They just recently actually issued a, um, a report, the first report to the town. And it's like it's a study of the hydrology, et cetera. So. Um, but nevertheless, uh, you know, Riverhead continues to pretty heavily develop uh, its immediate um, coastline downtown. Uh, I mean, 
they're building buildings or allowing buildings to be built where uh, if you look at the projections, uh, you know, those are fl- it's absolutely flood zones and they're absolutely going to be underwater in, you know, decades to come and maybe not even that many decades, according to, you know, the things that you hear now um, in terms of the acceleration, the accelerated pace of uh, rising sea levels, et cetera. Um, yeah, the, con- the conversations have picked up, but I'm not sure yeah. that the actions have kept pace with with the urgency of the problem. J.D., the other, the other thing is um, what's pretty stunning is how multifaceted the impacts are um, from climate change. I mean, we've we, you talked about storms, but as you said, erosion is a big part in, in our region. Uh, it's affecting agriculture. It's really a problem. With it's a monster with a lot of different heads that that we have to we have to kill and and uh, ultimately it, it all comes back to the same cause, right? I mean, climate change threatens everything that Long Island is built on. I mean, literally and um, and metaphorically. I mean, we more, more so it, here than than in other parts of the country. Do you think? Well, you have to remember that we we are a coastal people through and through. I mean, like even the most inland Long Island you can get still has still can see palpable climate change impacts in their backyard you know one of the things that we did is that we tried to get as middle long island as possible and we were in yapank which is like mostly flat green underdeveloped um and when we started to look around at how development you know influenced this area and you can see the early impacts of our settling uh, our, our, our Anglo settling there, um, you can see mill communities or like the remnants of mill communities. And you can see the early dams that we've established and, and the way that we've kind of terraformed our communities. And now when we have these big rain events happen, I mean, it doesn't have to be like a named storm. It could just be a big downpour. You have these impoundments that that are created by these old mill communities that now we just have these nice homes around. And that's where the flooding, that nuisance flooding, that destructive like year over year flooding, that's where it happens. And we traced that all the way down to the coast to show that, you know, you don't have to live on the water. You don't have to be a millionaire to be able to experience these problems. They're happening in your backyard because that's how we were built. So your question being, is it more here than elsewhere? It's just that we are all coastal people here and therefore everybody, all 3 million of us, how dense we are, we are impacted. And you see- With, with coasts on, 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 you know, on, on three sides as well, right? I mean, being, being an island yeah. that, that comes into play, you got water and people forget about the North Shore, but that's all water too, right? Exactly. Exactly. And um, and there's a whole lot of infrastructure there and a whole lot of old infrastructure there and a whole lot of infrastructure that's super vulnerable to stuff like this. And then we have communities that are supported by no infrastructure, but there's still hundreds of thousands of people that live there. And so like our really old septic tanks that, you know, uh, support our ability to live here or our hundred year old sewer systems hmm. that like are actually a step above what people, if you don't have a sewer system, you're already a, like a notch higher than everybody else. Um, but all of that stuff, you know, our human waste has to go somewhere. And when you put that into the, the pot of climate change, it just exacerbates the problems even more. So um, not only is it just the environment changing around us, it's us changing our environment. This is Behind Headlines on WLIWFM. Uh, I'm Joe Shaw from the Express News Group. My co-host is Bill Sutton of the Express News Group. We're talking with J.D. Allen from WSHU Public Radio in Connecticut. Uh, he's the Long Island Bureau Chief and Assistant News Director. We're talking about his new podcast. Our other panelists today are uh, Brianne Letta, who is from the Times Review Media Group, and Denise Civiletti from Riverhead Local. And I want to continue the conversation about this. You know, um, I'm intrigued by the fact that if you take one little snapshot, uh, one problem that we're seeing and how you can sort of trace it to uh, climate change, and that would be the population of shellfish uh, in our bays. Uh, I'm fascinated by this because 
the the impact started years ago with the brown tides and and the the red tides and the the various um, environmental conditions in the waters that were created by the sewer pro the, the the fact that we have septic tanks and we're we have a lot of pollution flowing into the base that was the start of the problem but now what we're seeing is a whole new level of issue with the shellfish populations and some of it has to do with you know you don't think about how climate change may have an impact but for instance one of the theories about the scallop population's difficulty in the last few years are the cow nose rays that are now in our local base. They have migrated north because the water is warmer. They're warmer water uh, animals and they've come farther north. So it shows the way this is all so interconnected and, and we start to see the impact uh, just getting worse and worse. And, and we've had basically uh, no scallop harvesting season for a couple of years. And, and this year doesn't look like it's gonna be much better. Um, Denise, we, we've, I think we've both written about the, the fact that there was a survey done recently about the scallops, um, and it doesn't look like the adult scallop population is going to be enough to, to sustain a harvest this year. Uh, although they keep spawning, and they do keep reproducing, so there is hope there, right? I mean, do you remember when we were talking that way about the lobster population in Long Island Sound a decade ago? I mean, mm. I, you know... Oh, they're they're spun. They're going to come back. They, you know, and, and we're watching it carefully. We're not watching that so carefully anymore because guess what? You know, it's they're not really there. They're not going to be there, and that's got a lot to do with, um, you know, the, the temperature of the waters, um, the the water pollution that you were talking about from the septic systems along the coastline, especially some of the older ones and some of the discharges from uh, wastewater treatment plants. I mean, don't forget. Um, lawn fertilizer. I mean, the runoff of lawn fertilizer into the creeks and tributaries of the rivers and bays, uh, they are, it's, it's horrifying and their impacts are so great. And that is actually a relatively easy fix, you know? Um, but we just keep, stop doing it. We keep dumping that stuff and that makes us want, you know, we need to pump more water to, um, you know, um, to water the lawns, to green them because we put all this fertilizer on them. And it's a, it's a terrible cycle that's easy to break. I mean, uh, you know, between the, the, you know, there's a total evolution of the ecosystem that we live in here because of climate change. And um, I think that, you know, the first step is to really acknowledge that what you were talking about, the flipping the switch and having this Armageddon moment, we're more like, you know, the frog in the simmering pot of water, not realizing that it's getting hotter and hotter and it's going to be boiled to death momentarily. You know, um, unfortunately, that's that's really where we're at, I think. And we can look around. I mean, we've had um, pub public water supply well suffer from saltwater intrusion from, due to just hydrology. Initially, they thought it was over pumpage, but um, it really wasn't. Um, we've got failing cesspools along the coastlines. We've got, as you mentioned, JD, the um, you know farmers with um, the saltwater intrusion in the and the groundwater table that's rising. Every time there's a big storm, the crops get lashed with saltwater here. Like if it's a wind-driven heavy rain, you know that happens. It it it's very harmful to the wineries and uh, the vineyards and and other crops. I mean, it's destroyed entire pumpkin crops. You know. A, a few years back. Um, so it's know. very, very easy to see Everywhere. that climate change impacts us in so many ways. And it's so easy to feel like it's overwhelming, right? It I mean, is. If we're saying that climate change is already here, that can be almost like claustrophobic or panicking to people that are, are, are we in this Armageddon moment? Are we already in doomsday? And one of the things that we really tried to, to, to avoid in higher ground was about telling this story as a doomsday story because there are things that people are doing whether they know it's climate adaptation or not um you know we are introducing advanced uh septic sy systems that filter out nitrogen um, there are efforts to replace chemical fertilizers that leak uh, that bring pollution into our waterways with more organic versions of things that we've had for centuries, like kelp, for instance. 
um, we have ways of addressing the shellfish population shortages that we have. You know, it's kind of difficult because there's only so many things that a nursery and hatchery for shellfish can do. But when we visited those, you know, this summer, and we took a look at the East Hampton shell fishery, um, and we looked under the microscope at the uh, at the, the the spawn that's there. You know, it's healthy at that point. This human intervention that we're doing is working. We're not all bad. We are recognizing ways to change. The problem is, is that you know, we still have to acknowledge that nature is going to take its course and there's only so much that we can do. And if we need to change our behavior to address climate change, then if we do one change, we might need to do another. It's not going to be a solution that's going to come at the end of a survey from the Army Corps of Engineer or even a project that restores sand to a beach. You know, that might protect us for 10 years, but we need to still come up with a new plan about how to fix the next 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, et cetera, et cetera. Or, but that doesn't mean that we ignore the micro changes too. And, and I think that that's an important point that, that we keep making those changes. You keep doing those small things and those small things add up. Certainly there's bigger things to do and bigger plans to, to, to make, but, but we, we need to feel like we're, we're at least in a small way attacking climate change, right? Something is better than nothing. Right. I'm curious, though, J.D., in, in the reporting for your podcast, Higher Ground, um, did you, I, you know, we have to talk about what has to happen. And as you say, there are some things happening and, and on, a, on a limited basis and on a local basis, there, there are starting to we're starting to see things change. But are there big sweeping changes that we need to start considering or what, what, what are the solutions to this on a regional level? that we need to start talking about um, maybe that we aren't? Well, I would say that there's one thing on the east end of Long Island that sets it apart from most places around the United States. And that is that there is an actual dedicated revenue source for dealing with the preservation of open space and the funding of water quality improvements. That is the nail in the coffin that kills projects and plans across the country before they even get off the ground. They get the survey that Denise was talking about and they realize that we were never gonna have the money to be able to do this unless somebody bestows it on us. And now like the Community Preservation Fund in Eastern Long Island has been around for 20 years. It's gained more than, uh, it's generated more than $1.7 billion and we've seen it been misused before, yes. Um, but it has done tremendous work, tens of thousands of acres preserved for open space, creating natural barriers um, and restoring wilderness and wildlife uh, to areas. Um, that money has been used to, you know, address water quality issues by doing studies that allow us to to find ways to clean Lake Agawam or the Peconic Bay. Um, it allows us to help those who might be, you know, working class people or, or just the people who live all year round on the east end of Long Island be able to fund the tr the changeover of their septic systems from one that is, you know, 30 years old to one that filters nitrogen. Um, so having that Renew, having that naturally restore or, or having that resource that the CPF allows towns to have to be able to pay for these changes and put money into these projects is already far beyond what many other places um, can do. I mean, it's the only region on Long Island that can do that. And when you look at regions outside of the East End, like the town of Brookhaven or Huntington or Babylon or, or Hempstead that don't have those types of projects, they're already at a loss because it means that that money has to come from somewhere else. That's a great point. And I also think that the fact that we have the revenue stream to do these projects puts the onus on this region to be innovative and to lead the way to, to try some things and to be really ultra aggressive so that we can maybe start finding some solutions that can then be done elsewhere 
um, a little more inexpensively or you can begin to find uh, ways to do them. So yeah, I, I think that's a big part of it. JD, I'm curious in, in your reporting, is there anything that you found that really surprised you? I mean, I'm, I'm assuming going into this podcast, you had your own thoughts about uh, climate change and how it might be showing up locally, but is there one thing that stood out to you that, that surprised you? I've been reporting on Long Island for about 10 years now, and every community, every community on Long Island that I go into is different, and it's carved out in so many different ways. We've got over 100 villages. We've got over 120 something, I think, school districts. We've got, you know, 13 towns. We've got two counties. We've got a state government. I mean, it, we're, we're caught up in so many ways, and we do that to be able to better control what happens in our backyard. Um, that's not the case in other areas around the country that I've reported in, like Massachusetts, Connecticut, Vermont. Um, and that has both helped and hurt us in so many ways, because as parochial, as granular as we get, it means that we want to have a voice in how we control what happens, you know, on our coasts and in our backyards. And, you know, sometimes it works. Sometimes we're able to allocate money like the CPF. And sometimes we go belly up and, and our villages fail um, and fail like for real, like Mastic Beach did, um, where they only existed as a village government for six years before they realized that the cost of doing business and preserving their way of life was going to was going to bury them. Um, or we have towns that, you know, are struggling to deal with this and uh, are not ready to say that we need help or there needs to be something else here. So I think what might have surprised me is perhaps this Long Island stubbornness that maybe we have that we live here. Our families have always lived here and we plan to continue living here, but I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to bury my feet and then my head into the sand. And as long as I can retire and my family can grow up here, that's all I care about. And it's that maybe closed mindedness either in in our communities, in our villages, in our towns, in our counties that is worrisome because we've been talking about that we need to do a lot of changes, both big and small. But if we're not willing to open our eyes to any of them um, or or presume that it's our responsibility, um, both personally and, you know, in a in a larger scope, then we're not going to be able to achieve any of this. It's not going to be single players that are going to make this happen. Yeah, we like to we like to have local control, but that means we also have local responsibility for for dealing with it. No question. JD, tell us again. Higher ground is the name of the podcast. Where are we going to be able to find this? Yeah, absolutely. Higher ground is the podcast. It's brought to you by WSHU Public Radio, and you can find it everywhere you get your podcasts from Spotify to Apple to Google uh, to Stitcher, you name it, it's there. That's terrific. And I think we here at WLIW uh, like to support our public radio colleagues uh, in any way we can. Uh, terrific work on that. And you guys have some other stuff planned, right? Uh, you, you're not going to let this uh, climate change conversation go. And, and I think that's uh, a conversation we're all having, but you have some plans uh, moving forward with that, right? Yeah, so all eight episodes of Higher Ground launched. You can listen to the whole package all right now. And as we roll this out uh, this week during UN Climate Week, um, we're going to continue to do things um, on a local and national level uh, to to you know bring attention to climate and and climate change. Um, we've got some exclusive kind of director cut kind of stuff that's going to be coming out um, with. Uh, people uh, local and uh, from far away that are going to be kind of commenting on this situation here because Long Island's a really unique community and that we're, you know, America's first suburbs and we kind of set the pace for the rest of the country. And, um, you know, we're the, some of the solutions that we've looked at in this podcast might be able to set a new pace for the rest. And I think really great work. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's a conversation we're all having. And I think, uh, as colleagues on the East End, I think we've talked about doing some joint work uh, 
you know, in doing some reporting on the subject because it is a subject that crosses over uh, all of our local borders and affects us all. So um, stay tuned. We're going to continue to have this conversation. It's an important one. This is Behind the Headlines on WLIWFM. I'm Joe Shaw. Uh, from the Express News Group. My co-host is Bill Sutton of the Express News Group. Our panelists today, J.D. Allen, who is from WSHU Public Radio, Brianne Letta, who is with the Times Review Media Group, and Denise Civiletti of Riverhead Local. Denise, let's talk about um, a kind of related topic, which is groundwater. And uh, PFOA, PFOS, are, are acronyms that I don't think any of us knew five years ago, but suddenly now we can toss them off without any difficulty because they keep showing up uh, everywhere. And you, you've got a new uh, flare up in up your way in Riverhead, right? Yeah, um, you know, they're easy to say, unlike the uh, names of the chemicals <laughs> that they, uh, I keep practicing not, them, but I can't. Not I'm even going to try it. <laughs> not even going to try it. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, they are, uh, you know, known to be uh, health risks to human health, and uh, they are uh, known to be pretty widespread, actually, uh, across Long Island. And uh, they are, they come from very common um, substances. Uh, things that are non-stick uh, sprays, Teflon, um, firefighting, firefighting foam. foam, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, things that are just all over everywhere. And um, New York, a uh, couple of years ago, I think it was, uh, first in the country, I think, to regulate, to set standards for um, PFAS and PFOA. Um, at, and that is at uh, 10, uh, maximum contaminant level, MCL of 10 parts per trillion. So, it's a, a very small amount, but with good reason. And um, anyway, um, the uh, one of the things that the state of New York started doing was uh, sampling uh, kind of known Superfund sites and inactive landfills across the state. And they started surveying, I think they said, 1,900 inactive landfills. And so we have one in, in the town of Riverhead in Calverton, and um, they did some sampling there. We've got, of course, groundwater monitoring wells installed at the site. And um, they came up with uh, levels of 110 parts per trillion for uh, PFOA and 49 parts per trillion for PFOS. And, you know, that's like way over. uh, And when I talked to Adrian Esposito about this, of course, from Citizens Campaign for the Environment, uh, she said she was surprised it wasn't much higher, (laughs) Mm. Um, you know, because, uh, you know, it was a dump. I mean, and it's the, the, the risky thing about it. It's an unlined landfill. It's not really a landfill. I mean, it was a hole in the ground that people that we dumped garbage into. Um, and uh, it turns out it's in an area that's a hydrogeologic zone of uh, interest, uh, hydrogeologic zone three, which is uh, a special groundwater protection zone. Great place for a dump. Um, and, <laughs> and all kinds of things were dumped there. I mean, for a long time, um, the landfill was taking in uh, garbage from the Grumman um, aerospace site. Um, so really nobody knows exactly what's in there. Riverhead actually started mining it a few years, well, more than a few years back now. They were going to, um, and that that's another long story, but they were going to actually excavate everything out of there, separate things, recycle things, et cetera, and um, end up with, uh, you know, clean land, so to speak. Um, but that, project bit the dust and now we've got a closed and capped landfill with um some interesting contaminants underneath it um in the in the groundwork uh, and so, those those are called forever chemicals right i mean uh, yes, partly they are. because they, are. they don't break down persistent doesn't as a word doesn't even touch it it seems like what they are so you know i'm, I'm not sure what happens next but um the the, the town uh was notified and they are um the, the county health department the, the the state's working with the county health department to test um, private wells that are, they call it down gradient from the landfill, like the way the water flows um, from the landfill, which in, at, is it northeasterly from there. So there are, they've identified, I think, 15 private wells down gradient of that uh, flow. Mm-hmm. One interesting twist to this, if I may, is that Immediately adjacent to the landfill, like sharing the boundary line with the landfill, is a sand mine. And it's been there for many, many, many years, I think 1930s. 
but um, it was sold somewhat recently, 2017, and the new operator um, has um, an application before the DEC to mine into the groundwater some uh, 89 feet into the groundwater mm -hmm. table. And the town is fighting that and has been fighting that from the beginning, saying that that if you mine into the, the groundwater immediately adjacent to this landfill, which I, I think is a first in New York, that it's like immediately adjacent to a landfill and they're mining into groundwater. Mining into groundwater is actually, even on Long Island, shockingly more common than you think. But um, if you do that, it's basically gonna kind of like suck the groundwater out and change the flow of um, the groundwater from the landfill and who knows what's gonna come out from under the landfill. And now we have an idea. <laughs> But up there, the state, <clears throat> the town is actually in court with the DEC over that because we all know how DEC loves uh, sand mines. So. Yeah. <laughs> I was just going to say, Bill, this echoes a couple of things that we've seen locally on the South Fork. Um, one is the Sandland uh, decision. Uh, that's a, that's a, a sand mine that's being used for other purposes up around Noyak. And it's the same kind of fight that the town wants to stop this. And the DEC has not been willing to work with the town to do that. And, and the town and the DEC are actively in, in a fight over that. But it's also, I was also going to say it has echoes because we've seen PFOA and PFOS in Wayne Scott and, and near Grabeski Airport, where people have had to be put on uh, public water as a result of that. Right. It's interesting that Denise says that, you know, that this, this landfill was taking, um, you know, stuff from, from Grumman. And, it, you know, for us, it's always seemed like it was aviation related near the the east hampton airport where where they would do drills to test this firefighting foam and and at Kabreski as well which is you know an airport and and air force air force base for um for for years and and yeah it was a huge deal you know a couple of years ago in in uh quag and east quag area um where they were they were actually bringing in bottled water for for the residents because it's all everybody's on wells down there there's no there was no public water um, so, so it was, um, it was a huge, it, it continues to be a huge deal as, as they try to figure out how to, how to clean that up and how to, you know, like you said, I, it stays there forever. So, you know, the, the option is just to get people on public water and, and the town actually came in and paid for hookups to, um, Suffolk County water authority to do that. Um, as for, as for the, the sand mine, yeah, it, it's, it's just it, it's it, it's odd that the courts keep ruling in favor of the town and in favor of um, the environmentalists, uh, you know, opposed to um, to to the sand mining site and, and the stuff that they were doing there, bringing in, um, you know, composting materials and construction debris and all that. Um, and, and I think. We may have, uh, you know, we keep we keep thinking we, we've heard the last word on it because the courts keep coming back and, and deciding. And there was a court decision that, you know, that sand mine shouldn't close because the town had passed regulations against sand mines in the town. Um, and the DEC just kept backing up um, up sand land. And we, we heard this week that um, that, you know, that that the state was. Um, um, was not going to allow further appeal by Sandland. So that should be the last word. But something tells me that's, that's just not going to be the last word. The DEC, you know, renewed their their permit to, to mine there. Um, and and I, I think it's just going to keep going and going. I don't know where it goes from this as far as this court goes, um, but the DEC is yet to comment on, on that decision. It, it's really odd, in, in my opinion. Um, the, well, the, the, that it just keeps going and going and the DEC just keeps supporting the mine where where the courts and everybody else is saying, no, that's not an appropriate use there anymore. Yeah, it's they just need the a concrete. Lot, <laughs> and a lot of, the, a lot of the industry, uses yeah. of, this, yeah. of this little spit of sand we all live in. No yeah. question. Uh, this is Behind the Headlines on WLIWFM. I'm Joe Shaw. My co-host is Bill Sutton. We're with the Express News Group. With us today, J.D. Allen from WSHU Public Radio in Connecticut, Denise Civiletti of Riverhead Local, and Brianne Letta from the Times Review Media Group. Brianne, I want to talk about, uh, we can't get 
off of one of these shows without talking about COVID. And mm-hmm. COVID is the, the big thing happening this week now that we're keeping an eye on is the state's vaccine mandate for healthcare workers. And that's something that came down a few weeks back. The deadline is set to arrive shortly, and we're going to start to see uh, how that has an impact on local hospitals, right? Yeah. So um, we actually just reported on a story this week um, because, you know, a lot of upstate facilities are starting to see um, mass staff resignations. You know, there was a hospital upstate that said they stopped delivering babies because they just had so many people quit. Um, But the North Fork doesn't really seem to be seeing that kind of um, those kind of walkouts. Like we spoke to uh, the Peconic Bay Medical Center, Sunnybrook, Eastern Long Island, Peconic Landing and San Simeon by the sound. Um, and most of them said, yeah, we've seen a couple of resignations, but when we spoke to them, more than 80% of their staff had been vaccinated by that point. And this was all last week and the week before. So, How does the mandate work? Um, are you able to not you're still, are, are you able to not be vaccinated and, and be willing to be tested on a daily basis? Is that an option or do you have to be vaccinated if you work in a healthcare facility? Yeah, so employees at New York hospitals and long-term care facilities must be vaccinated against COVID-19 by September 27th. That's, that's the state mandate. Just a hard mandate that, that the vaccines are, are something you have to have. But I, I'm curious if you've been able to talk with uh, it's difficult to to find folks who this directly affects, but um, I, I'm sort of fascinated. We've we've had this conversation on the show before that even within the healthcare community and almost at the same levels in the general community, there is this vaccine hesitancy that you don't really expect from healthcare workers who you would think would be willing to follow the science on this. But that's not really true, right? We 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 see almost the same level of hesitancy even within that community. Yeah, so we couldn't actually get anybody to speak to us on the record um, about uh, their views on the vaccine, who like, you know, staff just at local medical centers. Um, I will say that uh, the posts, last I checked, the the posts, our posts of the article on Facebook had like 54 comments or something because people are just really discussing uh, their opinions on on the mandate and whether it should be, you know, in place. Uh, I think I, a lot of people are saying it's not that they're against the vaccine. It's, this is what I've just been reading, um, but it's more about the choice of, of the matter. About the mandate itself. People don't like to be told that they have to get the vaccine. But mm-hmm. Denise, this is this is something, it's a little uh, subtle, but you, you don't have to get the vaccine. It's just that if you want to work in these facilities, you have to get the vaccine. And that's been sort of the the direction this is heading, right? Is, yeah. is you know, if you want to go to concerts, if you want to, if you want to do certain things, you have to get the vaccine. You don't have to get it, but you know, prepare not to to necessarily have a complete life available to you. And I I would say I think we're just kind of the tip of the iceberg in terms of what this could blow up into as this as mandates are, you know, become more widespread, like you cannot come into this theater or you cannot come into this store or you cannot come to this school. Um, You know, there's pretty fierce resistance by by people in general um, to a mandate. And they talk about it in terms of choice. But, you know, when it's a public health emergency, I think that, you know, the the question of choice takes has a different, um, you know, has has different limits. Um, I, you know, let's also not forget with the healthcare workers. I mean, it applies to everyone in the facility. Uh, you know, the people who clean the rooms and change the sheets and clear the trays and deliver the food. I mean, just just everyone. So um, it's not like the resistance is not just necessarily among trained medical people in the medical field, but just everybody that that's working there. And the other thing too is that. Um, it's not clear. We couldn't get a straight answer out of uh, the authorities, but are the healthcare um, organizations mandated to terminate these folks? I mean, mm-hmm. that's not really completely clear. Uh, they're mandated to get the vaccine, and they're but but what happens when they don't? Are they required to fire people? Um, 
Well, they could be put on a leave of, leave of absence. Yeah. I think I read one story, one of the upstate stories, um, you know, from from Rochester, which so, surprised. Well, it wasn't surprising, but but a, a, an odd note from the story is it had mentioned that, um, you know, the hospitals they were looking at, the majority of doctors had been vaccinated and mm-hmm. where you were seeing some of the resistance was in uh, nurses and, and other healthcare, care, um, you know, workers. Yeah, it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough to get a complete buy-in. And Brian, yeah, just to under, underline the point, it doesn't look like this is going to be a crisis for uh, the hospitals in our region, though, right? We, we haven't heard uh, any evidence that there have been any kind of mass resignations or anything that's going to affect the level of care that's provided at, at the local hospitals. No, no, nobody's seen mass walkouts or resignations over the vaccine mandate. Um, I did speak to Peconic Landing and San Simeon by the sound did mention that they are dealing with staff shortages in general. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that plays a factor, um, I guess, in, in their operations, but it's unrelated to the vaccine mandate. Yeah, it's another headwind, though. I mean, if you're trying to to staff a hospital, I mean, I know the hospitals always struggle for that. J.D., you're the Long Island bureau chief. Is this how does it look across the rest of Long Island? Is East is the East End sort of in a better condition than some of the, the other places on the island? Um, just looking at this, it, it 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 seems that the percentage of people who are unvaccinated and that this would cause a problem for would not necessarily cause like system wide issues. Um, one of the things that these hospitals and hospital systems have gotten better at is sharing resources among mm-hmm the facilities in in their care and also hospitals across systems sharing resources better. I know uh, New York Governor Kathy Hochul um, had said that she's kind of trying like a carrot and stick approach here, a carrot being trying to work with some of these unions to be able to offer pay incentives to um, to get vaccinated and stay on the job um, and to um, open up uh, some of the overtime hours that that they are allowed to get from their current workers that can stay on uh stay on the workforce um and then the stick being you know if you're if 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 there are hospitals that are going to have to put people on leave um until there's more of a direction of what they're supposed to do with these um non-compliant workers you know she is talking uh Hochul is talking with the federal state department about accessing workers from other states and actually other countries too to bring in and help with every level of care from, you know, changing over sheets to uh, nursing staff and above. So um, it's, it's interesting going to too. be interesting how it's going to play out regionally. I guess we'll find, we'll find out after Monday, right? I mean, when when the deadline approaches. Yeah, um, I think it's going to be. And, and it, it, you know, not, never nothing. There's plenty of restaurant uh, jobs opening up from, from what I heard. <laughs> so if, I mean, if these people don't want to work at the hospital, then certainly they could uh, they could go move make a make a and, move that and, way and no mandate there and also right. we're we now we're entering a time with booster shots and kids are going to be getting vaccinated soon too so real interesting couple of months coming up i think with uh, dealing with covid-19 we are out of time uh, wow. what a great conversation uh, thank you very much uh, i want to thank all of our guests today Brian Letta from the times review media group thanks uh, Denise Civiletti from Riverhead Local. Thank you, as always, Denise. And JD, uh, we'll definitely get you back on here uh, from WSHU. And again, the podcast is Higher Ground uh, about the climate change on the East End. Uh, and you can find that where you get your podcasts. My co host, Bill Sutton, thank you. Um, this has been Behind the Headlines. Thanks for joining us. And uh, we'll see you guys next weekend. Great show, guys. Thanks. Thank Thanks, you. guys.